Good morning. Very nice to be with you. Um, as David said, my name is Hannah. I'm an ordinand, uh, so I'm, I'm training to be a vicar. Um, and today we are continuing our series called Growing on the Front Lines. And um, this series is all about recognizing that following Jesus is about so much more than just sitting in church on a Sunday, that, that most of us spend actually the vast majority of our time outside of church. At work, at the shops, studying, commuting, playing sports, whatever we do, these are our front lines. And so we're asking this question, how do we grow on our front lines? How do we walk with Jesus into these places and make a difference for him? How do we, in the words of Jesus, bear good fruit, fruit that lasts? And um, last week, uh, Julie looked at the impact of our choices. And uh, this week, we're kind of taking a step deeper in, and we're looking at how our choices are shaped by our desires. So I wonder what you desire. And I wonder what first comes to mind when you even hear that word, desire. Um, Maybe you have a bit of a craving for chocolate or takeaways. Um, Maybe you've given up those things for Lent and it's already proving a bit of a struggle. Maybe you're a new parent and I'm imagining maybe your number one desire right now is for sleep. Um, Maybe you're longing for a job or a promotion, or maybe you're actually longing for retirement. But then we we also have deeper desires, don't we? We might have a desire to succeed or to prove ourselves. We might have a desire to feel secure or to be significant or to be liked. And I, I wonder if sometimes in church we're a little bit shy of talking about our desires, like it's it's almost a bit embarrassing to admit that we actually might want stuff. Um, But the reality is that even Jesus had desires. Um, This week, I just flicked through the Gospels, and um, here are just a few examples that might come up on the screen. Um, Jesus had physical desires. Um, It says at one point, they were leaving Bethany, and Jesus was hungry. (laughs) Jesus got hungry. He had desire for food. That is a relief to me that Jesus experienced that. He had relational desires. He said to his disciples, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you. You know, he he wanted quality time with his friends. And he also recognized the desires of others. When Jesus met people, so often his first question to them was, what do you want? Not what do you do, what do you believe, what do you want? So there's nothing wrong with having desires, but we need to acknowledge that our desires are powerful, and they they have a huge role in in steering and shaping our everyday decisions, Um, maybe even more than we might like to think. I don't know about you, I like to imagine that I am this super rational person, um, that I think about things logically, and then I come to a conclusion based on my rational thinking. That's how I like to imagine that I operate. But the reality is often a bit different. Um, Just to take a trivial example, I know from science and experience that uh, if I put my trainers on and I go for a run every now and again, um, it will make my life better. Uh, You know, I'll feel healthier, I'll get all of those endorphins you apparently get from exercise. But then the moment of decision comes, and I look outside the window, and it is a cold February evening. And then I look inside, and I see a comfortable sofa. And suddenly my overwhelming desire is to settle down and watch Call the Midwife instead. And suddenly all of my rational beliefs about exercise go flying out the window. Does anyone else relate to that? Or just to take maybe a more serious example, maybe I'm with a group of friends and they start talking about someone who's not there. And they start making some jokes at their expense. And I think to myself, ah, I know that gossip is really destructive. And I'm pretty sure Jesus says not to do it. And yet, I also have this deep desire to be liked and to be included. And sometimes that desire is what makes me open my mouth and join in. In our culture, we like to think that we're driven by our beliefs, don't we? We're led by our heads, by our values, our knowledge. Like the philosopher said, I think, therefore I am. 
But I know for me, actually, so often my decisions are led by my desires. And so it is worth taking some time to pay attention to what's going on inside of us, to you know, lift up the bonnet and look at the engine. Because if we want to grow on our front lines, if we want to make decisions that will bring good fruit, then it is worth finding out what is motivating us. Which brings us to our reading we got there, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Um, I am aware, by the way, that this is maybe one of the most famous passages in the Bible, uh, kind of one of the greatest hits. Um, but I would just ask, ask you to trust, try and see it with fresh imagination this morning um, as we look at it through this lens of dis- desires and decisions. And um, if you've got a Bible or a, a phone with a Bible on it, maybe just have the passage in front of you now. So, a man comes to Jesus and asks him a question. And this guy is someone who knew all the right stuff. Um, we are told that he is an expert in the law. He's not just your average teacher of the law. He is an expert. He is a religious pro. Some of translations call him a lawyer. And he comes to Jesus and says, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You know, what's, what's the golden ticket to heaven? And classic Jesus, he turns the question around and he says, well, what do you think? What, what does the law say? And this guy has been to Sunday school. He knows all the right answers. And he says, well, love God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. No problem. 10 out of 10 answer. And Jesus says, well, you're correct. So go and do it. And maybe this lawyer is starting to feel a little bit silly here. Um, So he tries to turn it into a kind of theoretical debate. And he says, but who is my neighbor? You know, like it's this kind of big philosophical question. Who is my neighbor? And Jesus responds with probably the most iconic story he'll ever tell. And uh, you know how it goes. A man gets beaten up, left by the side of the road, half dead, incredibly vulnerable, and he desperately needs help. And he is in luck because what are the chances a priest of all people comes walking down the road? And this priest, um, he's on his way home from work. He's walking away from Jerusalem, where priests would have worked in the temple, and towards Jericho, where a lot of the priests lived. So we might say, in, in modern day language, he's on his commute. You know, he's, he's clocked off, he's on his way home. Maybe he's imagining what he's going to do when he gets home, have something to eat have a rest, you know, it's been a long shift in the temple. But then he sees this guy lying in the road, bleeding, and the priest has a decision to make. Will he stop or will he keep on walking? Uh, Now this priest, he's a bit like the expert in the law in that he has all the right ideas, he has all the right knowledge. And yeah, he knows there are some some laws about priests not touching dead bodies, so there's a bit of a risk, but actually that's no excuse because in Jewish law, saving a life took priority over all other laws, and a priest would have known that. He knows what he should do. He should love his neighbor as himself. He should stop and help. But in the end, he just walks on by. And Jesus doesn't tell us exactly why. Um, Maybe he was afraid that the robbers were still around and they might attack him too. You know, vicars not well known for their self-defense skills. Maybe he was just tired after a long shift. You know that feeling, you just can't get home fast enough? And Jesus, he's he's a master storyteller, so he, he leaves us guessing. He leaves us to wonder, what might we have done? Because so often, we actually know the right answers, don't we? Maybe we've been around church a while. Uh, We know what we should do or say. We know the kind of Sunday school answer. But when the rubber hits the road, on our real life front lines, sometimes it feels like a battle of our desires. For me, um, this parable... uh, feels like it comes quite close to home um, because it reminds me of my old commute. Uh, Before I moved here, I used to live in London and I used to cycle to work every day and I would always cut through this same little park. And um, about once a week, I would see a familiar face in the park and it was this man um, who I'll call Roger um, who lived nearby. And Roger just had an incredibly hard life. 
Um, he'd, he'd gone through all sorts of tragedy and rejection. Um, he'd struggled with addiction in the past, and that had cost him a lot of relationships. And uh, he had some pretty serious health issues going on, and, and he was really isolated. Uh, and he spent a lot of time just sitting in this park. And I got to know Roger a little bit. And I have to say, I found it quite challenging talking to him. Um, because he would tell me these awful stories about his life. And, and I just never knew what to say. And, and I would walk away just feeling really useless and sad because there was just there was nothing I could do for him. And so I would cycle through this park every day and I would often spot Roger at a distance. And I would have a choice to make. Um, there were two paths going through the park. And uh, so I could choose. Do I take the left-hand path and go and have a chat with Roger? Or do I take the right-hand path? and avoid him and carry on with my day. And, and in that moment, there was this kind of battle of desires going on inside me. You know, on one hand, I genuinely wanted to show compassion to Roger, to try and be a bit of a friend to him. And sometimes that desire would win, and I would take the left-hand path and go and have a chat. But on other days, I would take the right-hand path. And, and in that moment, I would kind of justify my decision to myself, and I would say, well, I'm on my way to a meeting. It would be rude to my colleagues if I was late. Or I'm on my way to go and cook dinner for my housemates. You know, they'll be hungry. I mustn't keep them waiting. But if I'm honest, often that, that actually wasn't the real reason. Sometimes it was just because it was cold, and I didn't want to stand around talking when I could be somewhere warm. But maybe most honestly, sometimes I just didn't want his hardships to bring me down or kind of spoil my day. And I didn't want to enter into his kind of difficult, complicated world. And so I would pretend that I hadn't seen him and I'd carry on cycling. And the, the thing is, I was actually working for a church at this time. You know, I, I knew all the right stuff. I would get up and preach about loving your neighbor on a Sunday. Um, but out there on the front line, often I was more motivated by my own desires. So back to the parable. The priest walks on by. Then a Levite comes along, and the same thing happens. He walks on by, and things are looking really bleak for the man in the road. But you know how it goes. A third man comes along, and this time it is a Samaritan. And you probably know that to Jews, Samaritans were not just outsiders. They were enemies. And unlike the priest and the Levite, Samaritans didn't have all the right answers. Um, according to the Jews, they worshipped in the wrong way, in the wrong place. They just didn't do things properly. You know those people who just have all the wrong opinions? And yet he is the one who stops. He puts the man on his donkey and he takes him to an inn. He covers the cost with his own money and he promises to come back. And why does he do it? That's the question, isn't it? Jesus doesn't give us many details, but he does tell us that the Samaritan had compassion for the man. And the word Jesus uses there is this really like, gritty, physical word. It means he was moved in his guts. He was moved in his bowels. And often that is the word that is used to describe Jesus himself. It's not an intellectual thing. It's a, it's a visceral thing. The Samaritan, he's not weighing up the pros and the cons. He is moved with compassion. We might say that his, his dominant desire in that moment was just to show mercy to this complete stranger. And Jesus ends and he says, go and do likewise. So I wonder how that parable makes you feel. Um, I know it's a bit of a family favorite, but I find it... Um, quite confronting. I find it quite hard to read in some ways. And as I've been reading it this week, it's made me stop and ask, what desires are really motivating me on a day-to-day -day basis? You know, I've, I've got some head knowledge. I'm, I'm studying theology right now. But what's in my guts? You know, what desires are dictating the choices that I make when the rubber hits the road? I'm going to ask you uh, to do a bit of work. I'm going to ask you to use your imagination for a moment. And um, if you're comfortable, you might just like to close your eyes to, to help you with this. And I wonder if, 
you can picture a decision that you've made in the last week. Um, not, not a huge decision, but just a kind of day-to-day -day choice. Maybe it's a decision about how you use your time or your money, or how you responded to a colleague or a family member, or how you behaved in a meeting. And when you've got something in mind, just try your best to picture yourself in that moment. You know, what, what are you wearing? What's going on around you? What time of day is it? And then just begin to ask yourself, what desires are motivating me in this moment? Is it something really physical, you know, hunger or tiredness? Is it a desire to be liked? or accepted, a desire to be recognized, or maybe the opposite, a desire to sort of fly under the radar? What are the desires swirling around you in that moment, and how do they influence your decision? OK, you can open your eyes. Thanks for going along with that. Sorry if that was painful for anyone. The, um, the point of this is certainly, definitely, not to make us feel guilty about the things that we want. Because lots of our desires are for good things, aren't they? And there's nothing wrong with wanting to be liked or wanting to succeed. But sometimes our good desires get mixed up, and they end up in the wrong order. So like with Roger, um, my desire for comfort outweighed my desire to show compassion. Or perhaps sometimes your desire to be liked outweighs your desire to be honest. St. Augustine, the, the theologian, he said that so often this is what sin comes down to. It's about disordered desires. And it's not that we want bad things, it's that we want good things, but in the wrong order. So if we're maybe an employer who, who values profit more than we value our employees, then we might end up exploiting people. It's not that making profit is a wrong desire, but it could easily become a disordered desire. And we can so easily desire really good things, but in the wrong order. And we might know, like the, the lawyer, that we are called to love God and to love our neighbor before all else. But how easy is it for some other desires to kind of sneak their way into first place in our hearts? So what do we do with this? You know, it's one thing to recognize it, but, but where do we go with this? Well, I think we can, we can start by asking God to show us what is going on inside of us. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Psalm 139. It says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. And I think there's something quite daring about that prayer. You know, saying to God, you know me better than I know myself. Would you show me what's going on? Show me my blind spots. And it might be that you want to take some time to pray that prayer. Um, later in our service today or perhaps in the week, it might be before you go to bed, you just take a moment to think through the day that's just passed and think, what desires were driving me today? Is there anything that has got out of order? And to ask, ask the Holy Spirit to show you that. You know, he's kind enough to show us these things, never to condemn us, but just to help us to grow. So let's ask him to, to show us our desires. But then secondly, we can bring our desires to Jesus. We can lay our cards on the table and ask for his help. And really, I think this is basically the gospel we're talking about, because we come to Jesus with all of our tangled up desires, the good and the bad, the things we hold on to and the things that are holding on to us. We bring all of our decisions, all of the consequences, and we just lay it all before him. And what do we get? We get grace. We get mercy, forgiveness, and compassion. You know, but when we read the story of the Good Samaritan, we so naturally put ourselves in the shoes of the different characters, the priest, the Levite, the Samaritan. But perhaps the truest reality is that we are the person lying in the road, desperately in need of saving. 
And we can't seem to help ourselves. And we need one who will come along and have compassion on us. And that is what Jesus does. He picks us up, binds us up, does what we could never do for ourselves. And he pays the cost of our rescue at his own expense, not just with silver coins, but with his own life. This is the saviour that we have. And not only that, but he invites us into a whole new life, a new way of seeing the world. I love uh, the prophecy in Ezekiel. And God says, I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit in you. I'll remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. You know, that this invitation, it's not just to behavior modification. It's not to try a little bit harder, but it's to receive a whole new heart, a whole new spirit, to become new creations with our hearts and our eyes fixed on God's kingdom before all else. And it's not just a one-off event, it's a daily decision to come to him exactly as we are and to invite the Holy Spirit to gently redirect and reorder our desires and then to go out onto our front lines and see what God does. (laughs) 